Hi, good evening. By the time you see this, it'll be good evening. Uh, welcome to the last, the fourth of four talks on our current uh, spring lecture series. This is called Mamalosha uh, Yiddish in Jewish History. Uh, tonight's lecture is called The Living and the Dead, The Fate of Yiddish in the Modern Era. Um, I have to warn you, it was too much material, so I couldn't finish it all. And we haven't planned a fifth one, so maybe we'll leave it in limbo, maybe sometime in the future. I'll do a fifth one to finish this off. I found myself with so much stuff to do that I'll just take it as far as I can tonight and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that because this was scheduled as a four-part series. So again, tonight is the fourth part called um, The Living and the Dead, The Fate of Yiddish in the Modern Era. As I've said until now, this series was uh, is not only being sponsored but was thought of, dreamed up by Ed Leventhal, Ed M.S. Leventhal sponsoring it in honor of Ed's um, Mom and Grandma, uh, his mother Shana Bas Moshe Mat Aleshom, and the grandmother get look of his uncle Shmuel from Lithuania, who spoke Yiddish. His mom also spoke Yiddish, I believe. And um, without any further ado, I'll go into this. Once again, I remind you that I um, appreciate everybody who subscribes on the YouTube channel. And I do want to thank the tech team over here. My son is really coming at a late hour to do this. Um, for your viewing, your pleasure. So let's see who to leave. And uh, Howard Elbaum is doing, of course, the PowerPoint. And uh, Yossi Westing will be doing the final conjuring to make this a quality product. Without any further ado, here I go, as I always say. And tonight we're in the fourth lecture. <sighs> as we saw, Yiddish under attack by the Hebrew speaking masculine, that's on the one hand, and by the anal micromanaging and homogenizing. Uh, European nationalist states uh, of Europe on the other, Eastern and Central Europe. Nevertheless, Yiddish managed to survive and thrive in the 19th century. So I'm building what I said last time. Indeed, like a healthy living organism, Yiddish was able to creatively respond to these challenges, at least for the 19th century, for a while. The question was, of course, would Yiddish make it into the 20th century? Our story tonight is going to be like the tale of two cities. Okay, let's go. Right? It will be the best of times and the worst of times for Yiddish. Best of times and worst of times for Yiddish. Glass half full, half empty. First, let's, let's take a look at the positive. Let's talk about how Yiddish, in the case of Yiddish, the glass was half full. Now, go to the next map. In the 1800s, when your grandparents were alive or great grandparents, this was Yiddish land. It was a big area. Uh, what you see today, the different countries, but at that time on the right-hand side, the Russian Empire, the Pale Settlement, if you see uh, delineated there, a separate color, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that's the Yiddish land. All the Jews there, the great majority, spoke Yiddish. And also Romania, if you look in the right-hand, lower right-hand corner, you see a funny-looking country, and that's Romania. If you look on the map today, on the left, that's the where it is in modern area. It was a big territory. Now the Jews are dead. But at that time, those places had large and thriving Jewish communities, all of whom spoke Yiddish, and their masses. Okay? So Yiddish learned was alive and well, if under attack, under pressure, in the 19th century. Okay? So Yiddish was flourishing despite opposition. In fact, Yiddish was expanding in the 19th century. For the first time, you start to have newspapers, Yiddish newspapers, Yiddish literature. And this would only grow and develop until 1939. Then, of course, comes Hitler. Now, when I say Yiddish, I mean in all branches. First of all, the religious stuff, the religious uh, Yiddish culture and its uh, books continue to flourish throughout the 19th century, as it always had. As it always had. Uh, in fact, even more, because there were a lot more printers. And so you still have all the Sidurim coming out all the time, the Chumashim, the Mahzorim, you know, Trinas galore. Remember the good old Kol Yehuda Sitter? I do. I grew up with that. You could either get the Stern Sitter, which was the English, or the Kol Yehuda Sitter, which had the Yiddish with the Nakudas, the way I like it. And they even had stories at the bottom in Yiddish. Very good stories. And um, this was a bespeaking, a flourishing Yiddish uh, culture once upon a time. Uh, as I said before, the cleanest books were out by the Zillions. And uh, what can I say? Yiddish was uh, heavily used in the synagogue. But now, in addition to the religious literature, 
other forms of Yiddish material began to be printed. The important part was the Yiddish of what we call Bell Letters, as we see in the next slide. Uh, this is a term that we generally use to describe novels, uh, poetry, uh, drama, essays, plays, three tones, which are, uh, what should I say, thought pieces in newspapers, shall we say? A certain type of high-level journalism on commenting on life, on art, and that sort of thing. And uh, this never existed before. All of a sudden, in the middle and late 1800s, Yiddish newspapers with this stuff are all over the place. There's an entire large history out there of the rise of a conscious Yiddish literature in the 19th century. I'm not doing a series on that, because we didn't schedule it for that kind of framework. One could, and many college courses are exactly about that. The rise of Yiddishism, Yiddish literature, in the 1800s, which never existed before. This was conscious Yiddish literature, conscious in the sense of writers and intellectuals undertaking to turn Yiddish into, first of all, a respectable European language, formal grammar, proper spelling, correct syntax, etc., none of which existed before. And number two, turning Yiddish literature into a quality literature with a literary taste on par with the other, other modern literatures. To turn Yiddish literature into the kind of thing where you turn out really impressive pieces of novels and, you know, essays and things like that. Now, this latter project is actually fascinating. As I said, I'm not going that into detail. It was part of Jewish intellectuals of that era, not from Jewish intellectuals in that era, striving to transform and modernize the Jewish languages and their literatures, which until then were either old-fashioned religious or else new-fashioned but low quality. Excuse me, low quality. In the, the stuff that was written in Hebrew by the early Haskalah, junk, in terms of literary quality. Everybody knows that. In Yiddish, they call shund, also junk. The stuff that came out originally, people trying to write, trying to write, they have no talent for it. Uh, altogether, it's a, it's a turnoff. These uh, literatures, in Hebrew and in uh, Yiddish, the first newspapers, you know, the first novels, the first essays, uh, they were characterized by mediocrity, lack of style, lack of literary taste, taste, tasteless vulgarity. And the trick now was to transform this low-class set of Hebrew and Yiddish writings and lingos into modern European languages, European languages, written grammatically, correctly, with specific and appropriate words for all modern ideas and things, with writers who did not write junk, characterized by cliches, poor quality, inability to express themselves well, writers whose novels had lousy or immature plots, no character development, one-dimensional characters, as they call them, silly, extreme melodrama. You ever gone to a good old-fashioned Yiddish movie from the 1920s and 30s, like the Molly Molly Pecan things, a brief little mama, you can't go in there without two boxes of Kleenex. And that's, that's just the way it is. You understand? Melodrama doesn't do the word for it. But uh, I still remember, the guy doesn't see his mother for 20 years. And then he sees her after coming to this country, crossing the street in Manhattan. He says, Mama! And she gets run over by a cab. <laughs> you know, they, melodrama with a capital M. Now, these are the kind of problems, by the way, to be perfectly frank. Do you encounter today when you buy from books, you know, shops, these are bookstores. I'm talking about the novels and, you know, uh, that sort of thing, often. Some are better than others, obviously, but a lot of them ain't what you call high quality, okay? Um, now, this is, you know, characteristic of people who are trying to create a literature when it never existed before. Now, this is endlessly fascinating for us intellectuals who are literary eggheads. I mean, it really is. For example, you know, if you're, this is what you call literary criticism. And for those in the yeshiva where literary criticism doesn't mean you're criticizing somebody, it means you're trying to give educated critiques of, of, of what you're seeing. So, for example, how do you introduce the erotic? Every novel contains this in Jewish literature without descending into the cheap, the pornographic, or the vulgar. So do you have a novel uh, in which there's no boy and girl, no man and woman, and there's no romance? And I repeat, not cheap and all that sort of thing. Uh, even Marcus Lehman, who of course wrote in German, from Jews, 
has romance in his novels. It's, by the way, very G-rated. <laughs> That's not even the word. It's very G-rated, right? The, the rabbi's waiting for his wife. The, she's waiting for him to be rescued by pirates and things like that. A relative of a relative of a relative in Israel. And so what do you do for a living? And uh, he publishes a Marcus Lehman novel. I said, well, what do you do that? We censored him. Why he censored him? What was considered G in, um, in Germany in the 19th century is considered triple X rated in B'nai Brock today. So you have to eliminate all that kind of stuff. There's no boys and girls, no remnants whatsoever. Okay? So we're going back to the Yiddish writers or Hebrew writers of the 19th century. The thing is, how do you have a novel without remnants in it? These are questions of secular literature. You understand? And religious literature doesn't exist. Not expected to. But in secular literature, it exists. These are questions of literary theory, frankly, which are quite abstract in intellectuals, and Egg has loved his stuff. Me, myself, and I, I'm not a, a, a lit major, I'm a historian, but those who study literature professionally, academically, know what I'm talking about. I mean, published essays, they have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has to, and if you want Yiddish to be a real language, they said, you have to have writing that can articulate complex, extract themes, even the most thoughtful and sophisticated. These are things you're not going to pick up from a little bit of a or Yeshiva education, a little Kumash Arashi. Now, what's interesting is the Hebrew world, tiny world, of intellectuals and the Yish, both produced um, their own homegrown intellectuals, not with college education, who undertook to try to clean up the market and introduce standards into Hebrew literature on the one hand, Yiddish literature on the other, and try to raise its level. And they had a fair amount of success, which is a fascinating topic. For Hebrew, let's go to the next one. For the Hebrew language, it was Achad Am. That's how he became famous. He started a magazine called Hashiloch, of literary criticism, in which he said, now he was the leader of the Maskelet. He was an atheist. Let's get clear about that. And he was a materialist. So he wants a post-religious Judaism, although Judaism is not divorced from its religious roots. I repeat, a post-religious Judaism. So he wants a Hebrew uh, culture that will be able to be on the European level. This is as good as English literature, Russian literature, German literature, and so forth. Uh, but there's so much junk out there, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry, next to Sheba guy, thinks he can write. And so Achanam, who had a great reputation as a great writer and thinker, he, he published a magazine, Hashiloach, which everybody read, in which he offers literary criticism. You see this uh, new poem that came out? It's uh, infantile. You see this new book that came out? It's junk. On the other hand, here's this guy who just published a book. It's very good. And here's what's good about it. Look how he uses language. Look how he uses the plot. Now, compare it to the other one where it said junk. By criticizing, and again, I, I know my audience. Some of you are going to think criticizing just offering criticism. I'm talking about intelligent criticism, right? Intellectual criticism, which is an art form. By introducing this into the Hebrew-speaking world, Hebrew writers, he tried to create, and he did see to some degree succeed, in raising the level of Hebrew literature from the, uh, I would say, the very immature early muscular style to a much more chashub uh, and modern style. This is the beginning of modern Israeli culture. I repeat, he wasn't from, he was atheist, and he did it over there. Now, in the case of Yiddish, the same thing happened at the same time, but from the next guy, who was the famous Shalom Aleichem, the, the most famous Yiddish writer, okay, from the Ukraine. So do you see, he should have, let's go to the next one. Yeah. He's trying to also raise standards and standards. He did the same thing. That's the folks Bibliotech, the, the, the public li popular library, in which he reviews anything that was published in Yiddish. And again, um, pan the bad writers, praise the good writers, introduce young talent, instill standards. It should be that if a newspaper, a magazine, or anybody publishes something, should have readers beforehand to check that the grammar is okay, basically, that the style isn't stupid. It shouldn't be to publish something that, that we read and say, oi vey, how'd this get through? You understand? How'd this get through? Have a policy when you're trying to make the... If we don't make a chashev, we won't be chashev. You see? Above all, get rid of the dead wood. That's what all these guys were about. And uh, they kind of succeeded to a good degree. Shalom Aleichem himself was a prolific author. I mean, he wrote everything. Long stories, short stories, novels, plays, I mean, you name it. All in Yiddish. He wrote in Hebrew too, by the way, mainly in Yiddish. 
who described life in the shtetl and the city, because he was living there, with humor and satire, mixed with pathos, with drama, sometimes melodrama. At his best, he was an author of European standards. Pretty good. And even the guy read his work in translation. This was, my friends, a revolution. A Jewish writer, read by Gaim? Uh, wait a minute, a Jewish writer writing in Yiddish? Writing about Jewish stuff? Ew, the Jews are junk, Europeans used to say. They don't count. Maybe, 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 if you get a Jew who converts and changes his identity to European. So you might have a German Jew writing in German for Gaim. You might have a Russian Jew writing in Russian for Russians. You know what I'm saying, right? You might have an Englishman, English Jew, and there were writing as an Englishman for English audience. But a Jew, writing as a Jew, about Jews, and in that ugly jargon called Yiddish, and yet he made a splash. Here's a very famous incident. He ran into Mark Twain, and, uh, you know, he was introduced. He said, Mark Twain, this is Shalom Leichem. They call him the Jewish Mark Twain. And Mark Twain said like this, No, I'm the Gleish Shalom Leichem. <laughs> right? And, of course, he's being humorous, but nevertheless, that's the kind of reputation he had. That he was a kind of Mark Twain type. Now, this is revolutionary. You never had this before in Jewish history in thousands of years. Okay? No, no Hebrew writer made it that way. There's nobody who wrote in the Hebrew language that had that kind of splash with the non-Jewish world. As a Jewish writer, writing about Jews and Jewish life, the everyday life, by the way, the Jewish masses. Shalom Aleichem does not write about the richy riches and the elites and all the rest of it. I mean, he does, but he pokes fun at them. He's merely, as we'll see in a second, he's a champion and writing about the little guy, the schnook, the tevia. You understand? If you want an idea of how rich the literature in Shalom Aleichem is, you can say one of his least, uh, well, this is a matter of opinion, one of his least impressive works was jazzed up by the Americans and called Fiddler on the Roof, and it took off. The Fiddler on the Roof is Shalom Aleichem's story about Tevye, changed a little bit for Broadway purposes, given some music and some lyrics. And, you, I mean, I think you know this. Fiddler on the Roof rocketed. And it found an audience around the world. They, people are still performing Fiddler on the Roof in China, Japan, Africa, Asia. That's a literary genius. You know what I'm saying? Even though it's about Jews, in a shtetl, in Russia, people in other cultures, in Spain and Portugal, said it's a universal theme. We can identify it with ourselves. Right? I know he's talking about a Jewish father and Jewish daughters and all that. We can even identify because I also come from a village. I also come from this background. I also come from something similar to that, even though I'm not Jewish. So all I can tell you is there's an incredible Jewish richness because you can like or not like uh, Roof. I like it. Uh, but it has incredible Jewish richness, even though, as you know, it's not from. Now, this is interesting. Because that means now we are in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and Yiddish is coming out of the closet thanks to a couple of writers like I just described. And what was considered a silly language, maybe for Santorana, this and that and the other, is now, you know, up there with the European languages. In addition to Shalom Lechem, the other great writer at that time, the next one, uh, the other great writer was uh, Paris, Isaac Lay Paris. Right? Isaac Lay Paris. Who's a genius? Okay? He doesn't write so humorously. Uh, but he writes, all kind, again, all kinds of stories and poems and this and that and the other. He writes about real life in a more somber reality. They're not depressing exactly, and he's got a lot of genres. Paris is just a genius. I'll tell you right now, uh, and he wrote a lot of stories, including ones that you think are from, and when I was a kid, he used them in the Perche and all the rest of it, if not higher. You know, the Lidvak is in that Hasidic town, the Rebbe doesn't come. He misses Slichus. And the Hasim's so always going up to Shemayim. He says, ah, baloney, he's sleeping late. And then he stalks him and he finds out the Rebbe gets up. You know this story, right? The Rebbe gets up in the middle of the night and goes, and disguises himself and chops the wood and brings it to this old Almana and cooks her breakfast or something like that. But only then can he come to Shul. That's why he missed Slichus. But the Hasidim don't know it. And from then on, they say, the Rebbe goes to Shemayim and the Litvak says, maybe higher, if not higher. You see? Well, the truth of the matter is, that's a pseudo-Hasidic tale with a secular message. I'm not going to do literary analysis tonight, I'll, I'll spend an hour. But it's very moving in a certain way. Um, 
I myself, every time I read Bunch of Shvah, I got read it 10,000 times, you cry. That means he's obviously onto something. And Bunch of Shvah, Bunch of the Silent. His parents made it up. You know, the scene opens in heaven, and a guy just died, and they're having the trial. They're on the trial. And he, it's very Jewish, you know. Here's the categories of Senegar, right? The prosecuting attorney, the, the pending attorney. And first, and the prosecuting attorney is a guy with a cigar, you know, like one of these real, you know, tough lawyer types. And first goes to Senegar, the defense attorney, and he reads a tale of woe. This guy was screwed over a hundred times. Everybody took advantage of him. He was born, you know, unwanted. and He had a terrible life, and he never complained about it. Basically, he represents the Jewish proletariat masses that everybody takes advantage of. They don't do anything about it. And even at the end, he was like run over by a car and nobody did anything about it. And, uh, but he was always silent, he never complained. And that's basically the story. And then it comes a term of the prosecutor, and he does it very dramatically. Um, but the long and the short of it is, he opens the book, he opens the book, and he says, I'll be quiet too. I'll be quiet too. Don't look at me. I'm crying right now. I know this story 10,000 times. The guy's a genius. But then, by the way, the angels all flood around. They said, we've never seen anything like this before. You get a one-way ticket into heaven. And he says, if I can get whatever I want, because he's scared. You know, an Abba video comes over to him and all this stuff. It's quite a story. Um, he said, you didn't really know what Kalki had downstairs. If you have where to complain, the whole world turned upside down and things like that. And he says, if it's not too much trouble, then could I have a roll with warm butter? If it's a problem, I don't want it. You know, and everybody's crying in their turn. The prosecutor is laughing. And the marshal, of course, and I was too young to understand was a little kid, but my father explained to me, that's the Jewish masses. You see, they're so downtrodden. Even if they got their liberty, all they would know and ask for is a, a little bit of uh, bread and butter. But like I said before, look, I'm choking on, but it's ridiculous. You see? That's a genius. You get, it's a genius. So he had all these kind of stories, the three gifts. I won't spend time going into this. Isaac Bishop Singer, who I hate, his father was a Hasidic Rebbe of some kind or another, and he said, in Poland, he said, the Isaac Pear stories are poison chocolate, <laughs> right? In other words, they sound from, they are from in their way, but it's also a poison. So, all I'm telling you is the guy touched the soul. That's it. And it was clear that he loved the Jewish people, and he was impressed with the Hasidim in his way, even though he was a secular guy. And you can see, writers like Paris and Sean Lechem were prolific, they turned out stuff all the time, and the public read it with tremendous popularity. You have no idea. When Shalom Lechem died in New York City in 1916, a quarter of a million Jews went to the funeral. Where I come from, that's a lot of people. 250,000. When Paris died in the middle of World War I in 1915 in Warsaw, 100,000 Jews attended the funeral. That's a lot of people just for a writer. Why? Because they're so beloved, right? And they were loved by religious and non-religious people. You know, why? Because they write about the common man. You see, the story I just gave is about a bunch of swag, the poor schnook that everybody walks all over. The old writers who wrote about the rich people, the classic writers of, of all literatures, used to write once about, about the elite classes, what they call the Silver Spoon novels, that Jane Austen, that sort of thing, you know, the upper classes. Uh, here, nobody's doing that. These guys have contempt, or at least not respect, for the richy bitches, for the rabbis, for the machers in the community. For the Parnassim, for the you know people who have the power in the Kehillah. And they're talking about the regular guy, nobody pays attention, but they do. The shoemaker, the, the tailor, the water carriers of Tabby the milk the milkman, and so on and so forth. Who makes a hero from a milkman? You, you see what I'm saying? Now, I want to share this with you. Hold on a second. I want to uh, put out now a, um, a lecture in Yiddish with subtitles, though, from the most important. Yiddish writer, in my opinion, of the middle and late 20th century, and that's the Chaim Grotto, without question. You know, there's some idiots out there that think, I think Bishop Singer should have it, I get it, and he got the Nobel Prize, but that was a big mistake. Now, um, Chaim Grotto's a genius, even though he also totally abandoned religion. Uh, when he was a kid, he learned with the Chazanish, as a Chavrusa, as an orphan, and um, he went around, you know, he didn't have a lot of money, he went around making uh, lectures when there still was a Yiddish audience to listen to. He was a good lecturer. Now, here's one I found online, in which he's speaking in Montreal, I believe, or Toronto, and he's describing what was special about the Yiddish literature. It's about a three, four-minute business, maybe five-minute business, but it conveys a point. 
And the point he wants to get at, and I'm skipping the first half of the speech, you don't have to listen to the whole thing, uh, was that in classic Torah literature, shall we say, it's elitist. The Gemara is all about the, the elite people. The rabbinic literature is all about the elite people. The uh, Haskalah literature was about the elite people. Nobody glorified a love, the common man, not really, until the Yiddish literature came along. And there's a lot of truth to that, especially Shalom Leicham and Peretz and people like that. So, listen, if you know Yiddish, you'll love this, and if you don't know Yiddish, pay close attention to the subtitles. Kommen die Yiddische Literatur und hat bewiesen die Heiligkeit von der Jüdischen Wort. Die jüdische Literatur ist der Basingerung von der Woche, die Ketek. Mendel hat kritikiert die Schabes Jontev, die Kehidi, dem Baltaxe, dem Gewehr. Aber er hat es mit größter Liebschaft zu dem Amt von Jüden. Er hat gefunden an Neuze von Dreischaft und Liebschaft, da viele in die Macht des Bettlers von Fischke dem Kommen. Wer hat noch ein so wie Peretz, bei Wink und bei Sung, die Orme jüdische Freude? Wer hat noch ein so wie Peretz mit so viel Liebe geschildert dem Scholem Weiß zwischen in die Heiser von dem jüdischen Volksmens Oibes fällt dort nicht kein Boy. Noch mehr hat das getan, Shalom Aleichem. Er hat darüber gestiegen in sein Leubgesang zu dem jüdischen Volksmen. Alle Schreiber. Wem hat er besungen? Dem Kremerl, dem Seicherl, dem Balmeloche, dem Marbetergesell und dem Dorsi. Die same Woche dichte ihn. Shalom Aleichem hat das geschrieben, sehr Gutskeit, sehr Ehrlichkeit und sehr Träumerigkeit. Der Hasidische und Lomdische und Gewirische Ried hat ständig sich überzeugen mit Bittel zu dem Volkskünstler. Im gerufen Klesmerjung, Komendiant, und Grammenflechter. Der Chasm hat jetzt nach Klesmer, Jung. Diese kommen schon einmal, und auch viele Herren nach Chasm, wäre es kein guter Medizin, der Leben ist, bei Tal mit der Kommen gewesen, ab die Lüge haben nur. Das haben nur getan, die Schuster von der Schneider. Und schon einmal, ich habe dann geschrieben, ganze drei Romanen, wo er bei Jung in dem Volkskunst lernt. Der Maktior und der Musikant, wir lesen den Menschen der Roman. Wir kennen dasselbe Sorgen wegen alle große jüdischen Schreiber. Die jüdische Literatur hat für uns entdeckt das jüdische Kind. Was hat die jüdische Welt gewusst, mein jüdisches Kind kurzes zu schleppen, für Erneuerung sich in den Feder rein? Die jüdische Literatur hat wir glauben für uns entdeckt, den jüdischen Menschen. Ah, der Rabe, sagt mir ein Steger, wir haben heute gesehen, ich mit diesem Job zu reden. Ihr kennt das mit Plänen in keine von diesen Formen. Ein Werk gewesen bei Ihnen, was hat uns gegeben, ein Epos von jüdischen Leben. Und das ist gewesen, der Tanach. Doch was ist das Simen Mubek von einem Epos, ist, wie ihr wisst, ein nicht nur der Aristokrat wäre dort gewesen, nur der Kriegsmann und der Volksmensch und der Knecht, als ich als Steger über Homer Silada. Und ich komme jetzt hier nicht nur mit Schrabin und nicht nur auf Roma Wien und hier sein Knecht und die Dienst mit Hager und das ganze demokratische Leben. Kurz ein Epos. Aber noch ein Abschluss von Chumes, von Tanach. Wenn Sie so wie kommen, die größte Epoche von der Anschluss, sagt er, und so weiter. In Talmud ist sehr wenig da wegen dem Menschen, dem Stegerleben von den jüdischen Menschen. Ich weiß sehr wenig wegen dem Stegerleben von den Menschen in der Zeit von Rambam und so weiter. Und darüber ist eine merkwürdige Sache. Wenn Grätze die Gange schreiben, die jüdische Geschichte, hat doch heute gesehen, als keiner, kein Volk hat mit keinem Anschreiben, als eine neue Geschichte wie, wie Grätze, weil die jüdische Geschichte, wo uns doch einmal so viel, einmal gesagt, so viel Sporen, so viel Bücher, aber von die alle Bücher hat Grätze noch gekannt beschreiben, das Leben von den großen Persönlichkeiten. Das Leben von dem tagtäglichen Menschen hat Grätze nicht gewusst, in die alle Scheile schon zu wissen, von der Rabonne.
Und als der Bnoa war viele sie kommen zu verrichten, dem Tors von Gretz hat er irgendwie wenig Kanal zu können, viel daran, dass sie sich erleiden. Da ist der größte Räufte von dem, da ist das Kielisch mit dem Mendel und mit dem Schuh, mit dem Schuh, mit dem Schuh, mit dem Schuh, mit dem Brillen auf dem Spitzenort, mit dem Kassocklichen und Beruhigungslichen Blick. Und da ist jeder, der hat ein Riss getan, dem Vorhang. Und hat gewiesen für uns ein gewaltiges Bild von jedes Leben, von allen Stichten in jedes Leben. Reingerechnet, die machen es Bettler, reingerechnet, dass viele jüdische Kinder, die seinen Taschi geworden sind, auf 20 Jahren russische Soldaten, die Kantonisten. Die jüdische Literatur hat nicht nur bei Wiesen der jüdischen Volksmänner, sie hat dem gegeben Kaschives, sie hat bei Wiesen die Schenkheit seine, die Schenkheit von Volksmänner, was ist in dem Verlauf von den Jahrtausenden, der in dieser Form gerufen geworden mit dem Namen der Ram Horetz. Die jüdische Literatur hat bewiesen seinen jüdischen Gemüt. Und der Jonte von der jüdischen Literatur ist am Mal gewesen und darf euer bleiben, allemal der Jonte von dem jüdischen Volksmann. Adam. If you took the trouble to listen there, and read it, if you, did nice, you see the point he made very nicely, which is nothing but the truth. You don't see real life, um, you know, from the old uh, swarm, from the Torah literature. Eh, you want to get picky, you can rifle the shouts and tubas, and you can find it. You can. Uh, but that's not usually what is done, you see? And uh, therefore, the Torah literature, frankly, the Marshal, you know, the Peninsula, had no shekhas to the average kind of street. They knew it's holy books and the Talmud and so forth. It was no art school at that time. It was cut off from them. And the Yiddish literature, everybody can read, and he talks about people like themselves. They don't write about great rabbis uh, in these uh, books of Shalom Leichem and Paris and these other guys. Uh, they don't write about love stories between members of the Richie Rich elite. They write about Amcha. Amcha is Yiddish for the average man. And they wrote very well. They used a rich idiom full of from phases, because it's still the old traditional world. You know, Shalom Aleichem especially, but Peretz too, and others, if they're describing Tevi the Milchig, or Tevi the he's always quoting, or misquoting Rashi, I mean, that's, he's always misquoting Chumash and Rashi, as part of the humor over there. Uh, they're full of phrases, similar Hebraisms. Their use of language was so good, so skillful, the deployment of words was so skillful, that they helped create a modern Yiddish, a grammatical Yiddish, based on the old from Yiddish, right? But much expanded, and expanded with taste. So in other words, they were to Yiddish what I would say, and most scholars would say, Shakespeare and the King James Bible is English. It's the basic documents out of which people pull, whether they realize it or not. You know, phrases, expressions, uh, forms of speech, and so forth. Now, the example of Shalom Aleichem Paris, these guys lived in the 1880s, 90s, early 1900s, inspired two generations of Yiddish writers, of course, then came Hitler. Yiddish entered upon an era of unparalleled literary creativity, novels, poems, plays, drama, comedy, essays, literary criticism, even science, math, history, philosophy. And the world, the non-Jewish world said, where did all this come from? Whoa, because a lot of stuff got translated or heard about. And all of a sudden people say, where is this? Isn't it a Jewish ghetto, huh? Right? And everything I said so far, is part of the best of times, the glass being half full, the good times for Yiddish. It got a little better. Let's go to the next one. Uh, starting in 1881, which is exactly the time that these guys started writing, uh, millions, I repeat, millions of Yiddish-speaking Jews emigrated to the West, as we know, especially to America, especially New York City. Take a look at this. Um, I mean, it's incredible. Between 1880 and 1924, which is 44 years, Two and a half million Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe came to the U.S. and three quarters of them took up residence in the Lower East Side. So what is three quarters of 2.5 million? It's uh, 1 million 875,000. No, it's almost 1.9 million. Huh? 1.9 million in the Lower East Side? Uh, as you can see that, Jewish population, excuse me, went up in crazy numbers. And the great majority of people that came here were Yiddish speaking. So New York, which has no shachas to Yiddish, all of a sudden had. In fact, to be perfectly honest, New York had, this was famous, New York had more Jews 
and more Yiddish-speaking Jews than any city in the world. There were more Yiddish-speaking Jews in New York City than there were in Warsaw, for example, or Vilna, please, like, simply because they had such large numbers. That's a little counterintuitive. Yiddish becomes rooted in the New World, in places like New York, Chicago, Boston, and Baltimore, and elsewhere. Yeah, it happened because of the immigration. Okay, not only there, they went to South America. I can tell you, Argentina, Brazil, places like that, turned out a lot of Yiddish stuff. Maybe they still do it, not now, but for a long, long time in the 20th century. South Africa, all the Litvaks went to South Africa. They cultivated the Yiddish. Now, I want to remind you, before 1880, none of this existed. Before 1870, no literature existed. See, here was something that grew up in people's lifetime. It's a little bit like the Internet. I remember, and you remember, many of you, when the Internet didn't exist. Computers didn't exist. In our lifetime, it's come a revolution. So similarly, people are able to say, in my lifetime, Yiddish has not had a Tchias Amazing, it's had a Tchias, <laughs> you know, it's had a, a vivification, not a revivification. The heady success went to some people's heads, and Yiddish now enters the era of Jewish politics, the arena of Jewish politics. Herein, I'm afraid, lies a tale of Yiddish getting too big for its britches, although I'm sure some of my academic friends will shoot me for saying that, because this is an emotional topic with some, but here we go. So pay attention. The great political question of the Jewish people in the late 1800s was, will the Jewish people survive? That's always the question. And, wait a minute, will Jewish people survive? Will Judaism survive? Will Jewish culture survive? Or is there no room in the world for Jewish? That's always been a question. In Western Europe, then, as in America today, it looked like the Jews would survive, but Judaism wouldn't. Jewish culture would not. Right? Because, as we know, it's happened in America, we sing it in our own time, it's very sad. A culturally and spiritually anemic American Jewish, po uh, Jewish population would disappear in the silent show, silent holocaust. Uh, assimilation, zero population growth, intermarriage, and so forth. So as individuals, the Jews would physically survive, uh, but not as Jews. As Jews, they would become extinct. Right? Somebody moves to America, by the time you get to their grandchildren, they don't know anything Jewish. They have nothing connected with anything Jewish. They live in Baltimore, Maryland, as their parents and grandparents did. Sooner or later, they marry out. They just have nothing ever to do with anything Jewish. So now comes the next generation. The kids are Jewish or half Jewish, right? Depending, you know, if the mother happens to be Jewish and the husband isn't, so then they're Jewish. If the husband is Jewish, the mother, so they're what we call half Jewish. They're not Jewish. I mean, you know, don't ask me about their halachic classification. They're, they're lost. They're gone. This is a silent show up. It happens increasing numbers all the time. You don't need me to tell you that even the newest Pew report, but it's, it's a cliche already. What are the intermarriage numbers? 80%, something like that, in the non orthodox world. 70%, 80%, they're, they're crazy numbers. This is the end of this group, okay? It's not a physical holocaust, God forbid. Nobody's shooting anybody, nobody's killing anybody, but uh, Judaism is dying. Uh, the Reformed temples are closing right and left, the conservative closing right and left. Uh, Jewish institutions are dying, and the Jewish culture of that sort is dying. Now, how do you stop this? How do you stop this? Well, the Orthodox will say only return to Orthodoxy. Okay, I happen to agree with that. But the non-Orthodox, that's a non-starter, right? It was then and still is now. Anyway, you're that. So what do you do? I'm talking about in the 1800s. In the 1890s, the Orthodox say the only way you'll have Jewish survival and Judaism survival and Jewish culture survival is by being from. Nobody went, the ones who didn't want to hear it didn't want to hear it. And so what was the other possibilities? I'm talking about thoughtful people. If you're not thoughtful... And all I'm saying didn't mean anything to you in, uh, in the, the 1921 and 2021 and 1821, so it doesn't mean anything to you. But if you care about these things, then what's the answer? Well, one solution, of course, that pops up at that time is Zionism. They'll make a Jewish state and all will be well. Because the Jewish state will be at Disneyland. You'll have a place where all the people there talk Hebrew. <laughs> right? Sounded like a Disneyland idea. As we know, they actually pulled it off. But that was the idea behind Zionism. I repeat, this is a non from thing. So even though there won't be religion, won't be Orthodox Judaism, none of the halachic stuff, none of the do's and don'ts of Torah literature, fine. But everybody will be Jewish, and they will cultivate Judaism through the means of the Hebrew culture. That was the argument, and it still is. This is what we call modern secular Israeli culture. Uh, now, the, Zion, um, the cultural Zionists, which is the part that I'm talking about, they were the Haskalah, the Maskelim. That's who the, the... I did this once in the lecture series. There was the first wave of Haskalah, the second and the third. And the third one was dying out. They 
reconstitute themselves as the cultural Zionism and move to Israel to simplify, and they've survived there, as we know. Now, they were committed to Hebrew, not Yiddish. The Jewish state, the modern culture, will be in Hebrew. Hebrew is the Jewish language. They have good reason to argue that, right? True, it will not, they recognize it will not be easy to create from anew a new living language, but they were determined to do so. When you go to um, Eliezer ben Yehuda, as we all know, he said, I'm only speaking Hebrew if it kills me. And uh, even though people made fun of him and this and the other, and the religious and so on and so forth, the from Jews in Israel didn't like him. They talked Yiddish. I'm talking about Meish Arm. He said, I'm making a Ivrit. And as we know, Israel has created Ivrit. You can't deny it. Now, this required a war against Yiddish. Because if you got Eliezer ben Yehuda and you got Meish Arm and all that, then you say, not Yiddish, rock Ivrit. And uh, as we know, the Zionist movement committed itself to Ivrit. And all the schools and everything were in Ivrit. And if anybody tried to do a school or anything like that in Yiddish, they'd close you down if they could. Okay? And so there was a war. They used to send language patrols, I kid you not. In Tel Aviv and all these other places a hundred years ago, literally a hundred years ago, Rock Ivrit. Okay? That's why you have the famous story. True story. Here are um, 1920s. It's Achad Am. It's Bialik over there. It's Yusishkin, and I forget who the other one is. So f- four big machers of Ivrit. Achad Am. In his old days, he moved to Jerusalem. And they're sitting on a hot day in Tel Aviv, drinking tea and talking Yiddish. And kids go over to them, they don't know who they are. And they say, Rock Ivrit. This is funny. They're talking to Bialik. Achad Am. They say, Can't talk Yiddish. Rock Ivrit. And these guys say to them, Get You know, get out of here. It's too hot to talk Ivrit. Right? It's too, it's too humid. Uh, it's a very famous story. But it goes to show you that there was a language war that was conducted in the Yishuv and it was successful. Okay? Uh, and so, Hebrew, I, I'll say it again, Hebrew as the language of Jewish people makes sense. I mean, we all agree with this. It's the language of the Bible. Uh, it's the language of the Jewish classics. It's the language of Jewish literature down the ages. Yiddish is brand new. So it's Ivrit. Now, is this funny? We know the history of Zionism because the Zionists, thanks to the political Zionists, were able to build up their own Hebrew-speaking Disneyland because that's what happened. As we know, and this is a, an interesting aspect of the modern state of Israel. Starting in the 1880s and afterwards with the rise of the Zionist movement, they set up colonies and this, and that, and the other, run by the Zionist movement and so forth, and they trained people, Hachshara and who knows what, to come over and have all these kibbutzim, moshavot, and they said, it's going to be only in Hebrew. And everybody agreed. So the Imamish created, I, I repeat, they artificially created something that never existed before. Um, the Hebrew-speaking community as a living language. I mean, it hadn't existed since the Bible. And so uh, that's one of the great wonders of modern Israel. That they took a dead language, when well, I mean dead language in the sense of being a spoken language, they made a spoken language. So if you're able, because you have a Zionism who's behind you, to create a Hebrew-speaking Disneyland, okay, okay. Um, you just never had that. And not only that, there were many Jewish intellectuals in Eastern Europe who did not look at Hebrew as the, the Jewish language. They certainly didn't look at Hebrew as having any chance of being the Jewish language in the future. Now, they were wrong. I don't know if they were wrong. They were wrong in the sense outside of Israel, they were right. In Israel, though, they were wrong. So again, there were many Jewish intellectuals in Eastern Europe, way back around 1900, who did not look at Hebrew as the Jewish language of the future. Why? All kinds of reasons. Some opposed Hebrew because it was elitist, like you just heard from Chaim Grada. The whole idea of Hebrew conveys the elite categories, and this is an era of the common man. Others regarded Hebrew as politically reactionary. Uh, Hebrew is classicist. It's old-fashioned. It's, it's, it's a, it represents the values of the Bible. And these new people are social. They don't want that. Some criticize it as artificial. And it was artificial because, as I just said before, these guys created a Hebrew-speaking Disneyland. So, you know, if everybody agrees to participate, then you artificially create a modern Hebrew language. Yiddish is natural. You don't have to create anything. That's the language that people actually speak from the cradle. It's normal. It's organic. You see? And it's already a spoken language. So why go for Ivrit? Why create an artificial language when there already exists, they said, a real day-to-day spoken language which is throbbing, flourishing, producing a Gavaldica literature, expanding its wings as never before, taking off, even like I say, Mark Twain is, a, is admiring it. So why are we switching to Hebrew? 
These Yiddishists, because that's what they used to be called, a Yiddishist, had a leg to stand on, or at least it seemed that way. At that time, as I said before, entire Yiddish culture was exploding, not only developing, in front of their very eyes. And listen, Yiddish says things in a unique way. Hebrew says things in a Hebrew way. But Yiddish is actually, if you ask me, Yiddish is richer. has a bigger vocabulary. And Yiddish has a certain way. Uh, I hope you read the um, subtitles of that speech by Chaim Grad. I'll tell you right now, any of you who know Yiddish know, that wasn't a great, uh, what shall I say, translation. It was good enough. It was workmanlike. But there's things you say, he was saying in Yiddish, you just can't say in English. You understand? If I have to put 12 words together to translate one word, you know, you can't say it. And that's the beauty of the Yiddish. And that was the argument. This led many people in Eastern Europe to say dumb Hebrew. Yiddish is the language of the Jewish people. In fact, Yiddish is the language of the Jewish people. Uh, this came to tie in with a contemporary trend that was developing, that's socialism. Remember, socialism, at that time especially, came like Baskin Robbins and 39 flavors. Uh, now, to understand this, remember that the late 19th century, Jews were asking themselves, what is the future for us? Things did not look good in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, for Jews as Jews. Uh, now, again, if you want to drop your Jewish identity and adopt a Gaish identity, that's a different story, maybe. On the one hand, um, things are not getting better. And it's also the Russian Empire, was pretty clear, was not going to change, let's look at the next one, of its own volition. The emperors of Russia, Alexander, Alexander, and Nicholas, were not going to get rid of the autocracy, the dictatorship, and they weren't in the slightest interested in getting rid of their anti-Semitism. So you could see this is the way it's going. Now, what do you do about that? Remember, Russia had an increasing Jewish population of millions. As we know, some Jews emigrated. They hightailed it out of there. That way, those Jews who came to America and England, wherever they went to, South Africa, they avoided dictatorship and anti-Semitism. But the countries that they went to, in those countries, there was no specific plans of how to remain Jewish in America or the other places they went to. That's why they have the famous books of Chavetz Chaim, like the Nidche Yisrael, the Nidche Yisrael, in which he's bemoaning, all these people are going to America, to Africa, and, ever, and they're dropping their Yiddishkeit, which was true. I think we all know this. The vast majority of people dropped being uh, from, and little by little, didn't happen overnight, they dropped being Jewish, okay? So there was no plan. It's not like there was Jewish headquarters, and they said, we're moving people to America, and here's how we're going to set it up, a situation in America that will preserve Jewish identity for people. It didn't, there was nothing like that at all. And same thing in the other countries, okay? Now, a very tiny few went to Palestine, almost nothing. Those guys were committed to the new Hebrew culture. And uh, as I said, if you buy into that, so in Palestine, as part of the new Zionist business, your, your Jewish future will be assured. I didn't say a firm one, but your Jewish future will be assured. But the great majority didn't go anywhere. They remained in Eastern Europe. And there was still a baby boom going up. In the Pale Settlement, they remained. In, um, in Galicia and Hungary. No, it was in Yiddish land. What was their plan of coping with the problems of survival? How were they to maintain a flourishing Jewish life and culture in an increasingly complicated Europe where they are not liked? Now, I'm talking about here Jews who are post-religious. So the religious solutions were irrelevant to their way of thinking. Now we're talking about Jews who want Judaism, I don't mean Jewish religion, they want Judaism and to flourish, because they're good Jews. The kind of people even talk about are good Jews, they just don't, they're not religious, you know. They're good Jews in their way. Um, but how's that supposed to work? Now, as I said, there were two basic sets of groups out there uh, toying with this idea. One were the cultural Zionists, and they were, of course, committed to Ivrit and to eventually a Jewish state. Uh, they used to talk about how Gagans about Arbeit, which means the Zionist movement in the early 1900s, because there was no political way that they would get the Turkish Empire to give Palestine to the Jews, they had to wait till World War I and the unexpected pop up of the Balfour Declaration on that. So prior to that, the Zionists mainly concentrated on what they call work in the present, uh, take over the communities in Eastern Europe, and set up Jewish schools which are Zionist in spirit. Okay? They, uh, they wanted, so everywhere you went, they set up schools. Now, if they're secular Zionists, like the cultural Zionists, they wish to recast Judaism as a religion into a nationality. It's not a religion anymore, because they're post-religious. This led to a lot of fights in Eastern Europe, but nevertheless, the fact is that these guys were very active, and they set up entire school systems prior to Hitler. The other group who did this were the Yiddishists. 
But who are they? The Yiddishists argue that the Jews in Eastern Europe do have a flourishing culture. Thank you very much. It happens to be conducted in the Yiddish language. They do not believe in Zionism. I want to be clear about this. The Yiddishists were people who said like this. This whole Zionism is a cock and bull idea. It's a bunch of baloney. It'll never happen. There never will be a Jewish state. We're analyzing the political situation. It ain't going to happen. Okay? So get over that idea. Once you get over that idea, you just better get used to the idea that Jews are going to live long term forever and ever in Eastern Europe. So the question is how to uh, provide a flourishing culture for them to keep their Jewish identity in this Eastern Europe. Now, of course, we know, as unfortunately the next slide shows us, that they just misjudged. You know, they didn't know that actually the clock was ticking. Within a short time, they'd all be killed. How could they know that? So to these Yiddishists, that's what gives all this thing us kind of pathetic quality, everything I'm talking about. Uh, what's the expression? They're rearranging the, 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 the deck chairs on the Titanic. I don't mean this to put them down. I'm just saying hindsight shows us this. So these Yiddishists, to these people, the Jewish culture that has evolved in Europe, the Yiddish-speaking culture, is the Jewish culture. That is Judaism. And it's as good as any other European culture. And just as the others, other cultures are evolving in the late 1800s, early 1900s, evolving from religious to secular, not against the religious, but out of the religious, post-religious, Jewish culture should do the same. Right? So the Yiddishists will say, you know, the parents are from, the kids will be this, the grandchildren will be like that. It's a natural process. It goes everywhere. And as time goes on, the religious ideas just drop out of there. But we want to hold it on to the grandchildren, to Yiddish culture. Uh, now, as usual, there's a spectrum of opinions on this. Some were moderate people. They want Yiddish and Hebrew. Shalom Lechem Paris said Yiddish plus Hebrew. Um, secular plus religious. But others were more radical. They want Yiddish instead of Hebrew. They want secular instead of religious. That'd be radicals. When the Yiddishists tried to hold a convention, an international conference in Chernobyl, Westin, you listening? In Chernobyl in 1908, bitter fights and disagreements broke out over these theoretical questions. Do we want Yiddish to replace Hebrew? The left winger is one of the resolutions that Yiddish is the language of the Jewish people. They compromised on saying it's a language of Jewish people. You know, all these kind of issues. Now, um, Without taking you through a detailed and complicated story, because I could, let me simply describe some of the main trends that emerged in this fan de siècle this last 20, 25 years before World War I. These were the heady years of Yiddish and Yiddishism. Most Jews spoke Yiddish like Shalom Aleichem did, naturally, organically, with no ideology. They went to Yiddish theaters, which now popped up everywhere and were attended by large artists. You know Baltimore, Maryland had Yiddish theaters once upon a time? including Friday nights, I might say. If, uh, if you think about it, theaters, clubs, these were the temples of secular Jewish culture. They were. Um, what was the content? They were describing and celebrating Jewish life the same way that European theaters and art celebrate European life. But in the fantasy act club, these last 20 years, whatever years before World War I, economics was taking off. Industrial capitalism was flourishing in Russia. And if industrial capitalism was flourishing, so was its antipode, which is Marxist socialism. Uh, and these trends existed where the Jews lived in the Pale Settlement. Here you have the two famous prime ministers of uh, Russia, under Nicholas II, uh, Stolipin and Vita, under whom Russia, like, seriously um, industrialized overnight. In 20 years, they, I mean, went crazy. The factories flourished, and this, and that, and the other. That means you have a whole proletariat, a whole bunch of masses of factory workers and people like that, who are being exploited. There are Jewish, in the Pale Settlement, you have Jewish capitalists exploiting Jewish workers and proletariat. In response, the proletariat created what they called the Bund, the Great Union, the, uh, the Universal Jewish Union. The Bund would fight for the workers, and they did. But since it's Eastern Europe, it's Yiddish land, the Bund, I mean, they're all Yiddish speakers, right? So it's a Marxist movement, which is an atheist movement, but in Yiddish language. Marxism even posits the end of... Jewish identity. The problem was Karl Marx, and let's go to the next one, it was a real moms there. Karl Marx and Marxism hated Jews and Jewish culture in any form. Now, if Jews give up their identity, then they should have full rights, they said. But any Jewish stuff, including Yiddish, is bad. 
So Karl Marx, as you see over here, hated Jewish culture and its distinctiveness. So I repeat, Karl Marx was a weird sort of liberal. No, he wasn't. He's a very typical Western liberal. If you give up your Jewish identity and completely, you know, blend into the local culture, whatever it is, in this case, socialist culture, then fine. You should have complete and total civil rights and access to all levers of power. All right? This became the, the way of thinking for the communists and all the others. Provided you give up your Jewish identity, and provided you talk Russian or whatever the language that the guy wanted to speak. But if you want to be Jewish, let it, forget from, you want to be Jewish and have your own Jewish separateness and Yiddish language, this, that, and the other, Ugh. right? Now, they didn't say it for other groups, but at the end of the day, Marxism has a strong dose of, uh, I'm not saying anti-Semitism, but anti-Judaism. No question about that. Instinctively, then, the Bund, which is a large organization, had tens of thousands of members. The Bund and the Yiddish-speaking Jews simply could not go along with these Marxist notions. So they are Marxist, but they have what they call Palgini di Bura, or cognitive dissonance. Just as Yiddishism wanted a Judaism divorced from religion, so too Yiddish socialists one of the Marxism divorced from the Marxian demands that the Jews shed their ethnic identities. They didn't like that. Now, let's go to the next one. The regular Marxists, Lenin, all those guys, wanted these Jews to toe the line. I'm not going to bore you. It's actually interesting. I'm not going to give you the history of all the pre-1914 communist conventions. They have movies about them now in which Lenin forced the Jewish workers out of the Russian Workers' Federation and set up the Bolshevik Party and all this stuff. But the bottom line is Lenin basically is saying like this. If you want to be 100% socialist and, and a Russian, all the rest of call it, vote, then you can be an equal member of me. And Lenin, Bolshevik Party had plenty of those types of Jews who shed their identities and adopted a Russian identity. Okay? Now, um, and, and if you did that, I mean, look at this picture. Here's uh, uh, Trotsky, who's basically trying to live a post-Jewish life. He didn't convert, he didn't believe in any religion. He's trying to live a non-Jewish life. Read his autobiography, it's nothing, not the word Jew doesn't appear. There's Lenin on the right-hand side. On his left, I recognize Kamenev, and a bunch of these other guys are Jewish. No, but they're not Jewish. They've dropped their Jewish identity, and they're totally Russian, and they're totally Russian communists. You see what I'm saying? You get it? it it's, it's like converting to another religion, except there's nothing religious over here. You're, it's a matter of converting your identity. Does that make sense? Converting your identity. Now, the Bundist types, I'm talking about, didn't want to do that. They wanted to be Jewish as well as Marxist. And they had a hard time getting along with Lenin and the other guys. Stalin later on, too. Within their own circles, however, they created a Jewish culture of an extremely anti-religious variety. In the film world, it's very famous. You know, the, the Bundists had dances on Yom Kippur. You know? uh, and also, by the way, an extremely anti-Zionist and anti-Hebrew variety. I mean, this was Yiddishism on steroids. Now, how does one do that exactly? Well, they gave it a good try. They were a, a totalizing party. So they built up a salt culture of their own. I've spoken about this in the past. In the late 1800s, starting with the German Social Democratic Party, these political parties on the left created whole worlds, not just political parties. In America, we're used to the idea that um, the two parties, and you vote. Plenty of people don't even vote. Let's say you vote. Believe me, if you vote in Baltimore, Maryland for all the primaries and all the election dates, you're a good citizen, <laughs> right? A lot of people don't do that. How many people are full-time active in politics? Only the office holders and maybe a member of their staff. Even if you vote, if, if you, you know, in election time, some people get worked up and they'll work on behalf of a candidate. You know, Bernie Sanders, all that business, Trump and so forth. Um, could even be local. You know, a guy might say, I'm working for Yitzhi Schleifer. For a month, right? For a week, you know, whatever. But then you go back to regular life. In Europe, it wasn't like that. For various reasons, the Social Democratic Party, which is the Socialist Party, said, we have a mass of workers who are, 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 are voters. These guys are all too poor to get anything done. But you want to know something? Even before we were in power in Parliament, if we pull our money, um, let's say if everybody gives in a few bucks, we can create a summer camp for the children of the workers outside of town. So not only the richy riches get to a, a healthy summer camp, we can rent a place and run it for the poor kids. Poor kids. If we pull together a little bit of money, we can, we can rent out a, an orchestra and have our own concert. We can make our own libraries. We can make our own outings on weekends. We can make our own trips you know, to Disneyland and so forth. And so this is a question of money. And so they did this. And what happens is you're Atlanta born, Atlanta bred, and when you die, Atlanta dead. 
You live your whole life within the socialist party. You read their literature. You go to their uh, dances. You go to their uh, uh, meals. Uh, you, you know, you, you obviously you work on their behalf in the political arena. You meet a girl, uh, and that's who you marry from the same background. That's what happened with the Bundes and the Yiddishes. Create a whole world. It's schools. It's summer camps. It's reading societies. It's youth groups. You name it. It's a swimming club. It's a spelling bee. Whatever it is. All within that subculture. And so these were flourishing. These are the guys that when they came to the United States of America, they made the Shalom Aleichem schools or the parrot schools. Maybe some of you have heard that. And camps. If you went back 100 years ago, that would be 1921, not 2021, in New York, there were a whole bunch of these schools, uh, which I think were not, were put, it's like Talmud Torah. You know, you went to public school, and you went for a couple hours a day, Yiddish schools, where they taught atheist Yiddish culture, you know, heavily involved with, uh, you know, literature and things of that nature. They had camps in the summer. It's a sign of the times, though. I remember reading not that long ago, some of these old guys, oh, let's put it this way, there was a camp like this in New Jersey, and they just sold the summer, Right? Because these old guys, their own kids that aren't into that stuff, if their kids are even Jewish at all. And Satmar can take anything because they actually have kids. You see? So, um, but once upon a time it was like that. They were nuts. But it indicates how vigorous Yiddish was once upon a time. Please remember, in New York City, there were five Yiddish newspapers. Guess their combined circulation. How many daily readers of Yiddish newspapers were in New York? The answer is 500,000, half a million. That's a lot. Right? I, I'll say it again. There, there were half a million Jews that every day got the Yiddish paper, newspaper. Uh, my parents did. Maybe your parents did also, or grandparents. Uh, every day get the Yiddish paper. So that means, um, and subscribers, I say again. Then, my friends, came 1914 and World War I, and things started to go south. First of all, the Eastern Front, right? The terrible Eastern Front was in Yiddish land. If you look on the right side of the map and all those lines over there, that's the Eastern Front, which I gave a whole series of one a couple of years ago. And if you see the armies going back and forth in gigantic, terrible battles, it's in Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, it's in Yiddish land. So there were mass deaths, collateral damage, uh, typhus epidemics, all kinds of terrible things were going on over there, okay? Um, when the war was over, let's go to the next map. So the American Jews went to the Treaty of Versailles. They were backed by Woodrow Wilson, led by the leader of the American Jewish Committee, America's most prominent Jew, one of the leading attorneys in the United States of America. In fact, uh, if William Howard Taft had his way, he would have put him on the Supreme Court. Louis Marshall, who was a leading Reform Jew, and he fought the fight that in all the uh, treaties setting up the new countries in Europe, it should say that the Jews have minority rights, called the minority treaties, including the right to have their own Yiddish language, culture, school system, everything paid for by the state. So let's go to the next one. If you look, this is Europe after World War I. If you look at the countries in color, on the right-hand side, more or less, you see going down, it's Finland, then Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, then Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and so forth, and Romania. These are all the new countries that emerged after World War I. They all had to sign treaties. They didn't like it. Say, yes, we recognize the Jewish culture as a separate culture. We're going to honor it, and we're going to bankroll everything Yiddish. Now, they lied. They didn't do it, but they committed themselves to that, which is like a high-water mark of Yiddish in world culture, because it wasn't even the Hebrew language. But they said it, it was acknowledged by everyone, Yiddish is the language of the millions of Jewish masses in those countries. Okay? Now, in reality, every one of these countries, except for Czechoslovakia, uh, was hostile to Yiddish, because um, they were hostile to Jews. During the interwar period in the 1920s and 30s, it became clear there's no long-term uh, you know, future for Jews if they do not learn the local lingo. Get it? Now, this has to do with ethnic politics in Europe, and I touched on it the other day. Are you speaking Hungarian, Romanian? That's a political question. Uh, are you speaking Polish or Ukrainian? That's a political question. The Polish government at that time wouldn't allow the Ukrainians to have Ukrainian language schools, and so on and so forth. You have a little bit of this in this country where they said they shouldn't have whole Spanish-speaking school systems because then they'll kill the English language. You know, those sort of political footballs. And in, all, in, in the whole area of that business, if you're Jewish in Poland, you got to learn Polish. You see? And if you're young, you're just going to do it. If you're Jewish in Lithuania, you're going to learn Lithuania. You understand? The older generation won't. Maybe the middle aged guys. The young ones are going to do it. And that's what was happening slowly but surely in the 1920s and 30s. So even though Yiddish is still flourishing, it's spoken on the street, 
as the language of the cheder and all the rest of it, the kids, sooner or later, here and there, they are getting a, uh, a, an education in the language of the country. Right? They're just doing it. Once they learn the local linguos, Yiddish didn't look like it had a great long-term future because Yiddish flourished when it was cultural and celerity, and here that's being breached in 1920s and 30s by the demands of the state. You understand? You want to get in Czechoslovakia, you're going to learn Czech. The Czechs were liberal, they didn't make you do it. But I'll say again, you want to get a job in the economy, you're going to learn Czech. You're just going to do it. You see? So, um, you had a funny situation. Little by little, as far as the young generation is concerned, they're going to be weaned away, it's going to take a time. But meanwhile, Yiddish was flourishing uh, because, uh, and had determined advocates. The Evo was set up in um, Lithuania and in uh, Poland, actually, in the 1920s. The Yiddish Scientific Institute to, to have a, uh, study Yiddish uh, scientifically and gather material from all over the world and things like that. Best of times or worst of times. They had an entire generation of young writers and poets growing up in the 1920s and 30s. They mostly get killed by Hitler. But in their, they had their five minutes of fate. In America, the fate of Yiddish was similar to the fate of traditionalism. What happened in Baltimore and other places? The first generation came over was from, uh, and really religious. You go to some of the old synagogues downtown and see a lot of Gamars. But the second generation, kids went to public school, and they still were fairly traditional. By the third generation, it's gone. You know, that's how it goes. So that's what happened with the Yiddish. The first generation came over, and for a while, but, uh, so understand me well, from, the, from let's say, 1890, to 1930s, the Frum Schultz in Baltimore did well because they had this element that grew, but they just weren't followed by their kids. So let's say somebody came here in the 1890s in their 20s, and they're the type of just, just traditionalists. So they'll go to a shul in Baltimore and participate in Frum life in the 1890s, early 1900s, you know, in the 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, so that would take you down to the 1930s or something like that. By the time you get to the 1940s, they're in their 60s and then their 70s, the kids aren't with them. So you come to the shul, you see a lot of old people. Exact same thing happened with Yiddish. It had its heydays, it had its five minutes of fame. And if you came to this country, literally in 1921 or 1910, in Baltimore, you hear a lot of Yiddish and all the signs and stories would be Yiddish. And that's how they teach in the haters and the schools in Yiddish. And uh, there's a thriving Yiddish theater here. And they have uh, uh, reading clubs and all this kind of stuff. Going to the old Jewish times 100 years ago, you see a lot of Yiddish uh, activities going over here. Not from, because people liked it, okay? But l more and more the younger generation wasn't part of that. that that's my point, okay? Uh, in the USSR, Yiddish became a football with bizarre results. Uh, the way communist politics works out with Lenin, in the end, the communists took over the country. Um, they didn't like the Bundes, so they killed them. But if you're a regular Jewish, for a whole bunch of reasons I don't want to get into, they worked out finally a system under Stalin particularly, in which they said that all uh, messages to the population will be socialist in content, national in form. So basically you can write Yiddish, but it's all communism. It, literally. If you ever read a book that came out in, in, in Soviet Union, it's all communist stuff just in the Yiddish language. And they hated Hebrew because Hebrew is connected with Zionism and with what they call reaction, in their opinion. Therefore, you get in big trouble for having Hebrew, but you have no trouble at all for having Yiddish. They even set up in Birobijan uh, in the 1930s a Jewish state all in Yiddish. I mean, it, didn't, it was a joke, but that's what they did. Um, that's Stalin, okay? Uh, you have these magazines, the Sovet, the Shaheimland. I used to read it sometimes in the Hebrew college. You can't read it. It was unreadable. It was pure communist junk, pure, just in, in, in Yiddish letters. That's what they did. And even then, there was a little bit of Yiddish culture, totally communistic, and Stalin eventually killed them all. It's called the, the Night of the Poets, when he just shot all these guys. You know, no big surprise over there. My friends, it's too much to run through this quickly. And uh, that's why I said, uh, I'm not going to be able to finish this tonight. I've gone long enough. One day, perhaps, We'll do the fifth and final uh, talk by Yiddish. Well, let's say from the First World War I. I'll just make a few general observations. We all know that Hitler killed all the Yiddish speakers in World War II. We know the State of Israel popped up afterwards as committed writ. Although I can tell you after the Holocaust, Ben-Gurion, the other guy, Ben-Gurion talked Yiddish by himself. <laughs> Out there he talked Hebrew. He talked Yiddish by himself. I think I told you once. 1959, 
It's a famous scandal called the Night of the uh, Rubber Duckies, Bar Lil Barbazim. And uh, all the generals were at a concert in Tel Aviv, and there was a screw up because somebody proclaimed general mobilization, and Nasser, and he just thought Israel's launching a surprise attack. Everything went crazy, and Eisenhower called the Ben Gurion. What's going on? And Ben Gurion wants to get a hold, he's in Jerusalem, wants to get a hold of a, a general staff. And they're all at the concert, and he calls up the concert. And he said, Medaber Ben Gurion, you know, I knew it's Kashem Ramad Kal. I want to speak with the chief of staff. And the guy didn't believe him. He said, You're Ben Gurion? Yeah, like I'm Ben like I'm Nasser, you know? They called him back, he said, I need Ben Gurion, I knew it's Get out of here. Finally, called him up, start cussing about Yiddish. The best at Pascal Yak. Oh, it is Ben Gurion. So he put him on there. This became what they called the language of the Kedoshim. In Israel, they adopted a different attitude. They're not going to revive Yiddish, but people would publish Yiddish because this is the language of the martyrs, six million people. It gave an elegiac kind of quality. Uh, in America, Yiddish Mamash had, like I said, the traditionalists. You and I today are living in the sort of revived orthodoxy that came after the rise of the day school and yeshiva movement. The Yiddish just never developed anything like that. So therefore they had their five minutes of fame. And this guy said before, Chaim Grada was a great writer, just went around talking to older and older audiences. Uh, he was a weirdo, so he and his wife wouldn't let their work be translated into English, except a few. It was that kind of a, a business. Today Yiddish is trying to make a comeback in the academic world, uh, you see, if it's Ivrit, then it has to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. If it's Yiddish, then it only has to do with uh, a depoliticized Jewish. That's my personal opinion of why you have the revival interest in the Yiddish. But be that as it may, um, it, it hasn't taken off. The irony is today, as we all know, Yiddish flourishes among the Hasidim, and that's it. Okay? Among the Hasidim. In Israel, it's funny. The Hasidim are speaking Ivrit, but they also speak Yiddish. So they're bilingual. So you have sort of like, in a, in a screwball fashion, you have the Haskalah model, right? <laughs> Except Haskalah is thought to be French in Hebrew, you know, so it's Yiddish in Hebrew. Uh, the Hasidim aren't interested in the Yiddishism, they're not interested in academic uh, courses on Yiddish and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the irony uh, that we have today. There are some other remarks I could say along the lines, but in case we ever have a last talk, I'll devote myself then to that. For now, I end this fourth of the four lectures. I've taken you through most of the history of Yiddish, and with that, I wish you a good night and a good yard.